The psalmist says that it is good for us to come into the house of the Lord. We realize that in these days that many of us are not able to physically come to church, even though our hearts may long to do that. That is why we consider it a privilege and an honor for us to come into your home, the place where God has already come to live and to dwell and to share together in this time of worship, this time of rejoicing, in this time of uh, being together. And so we give thanks for you this day for joining in worship. We are Hanson United Methodist Church and I'm Tammy Coleman and we give thanks for you this day. hymns were first written as prayers that were later put to music and we uh, can sing these prayers and lift them up but often it's good to go back and just pray these words so I invite you to pray with me this day these words that come from our hymn 
Breathe on me, breath of God. Let us pray. Breathe on us, breath of God. Fill us with life anew, that we may love what you love and do what you would do. Breathe on us, breath of God, until our hearts are pure. Until with you, we will, your will, to do and to endure. Breathe on us, breath of God, till we are wholly thine, until all this earthly part of us glows with your fire divine. Breathe on us, breath of God, so we will never die, but live with you the perfect life of your eternity. May this, Lord, be our prayer, that you would breathe on us your very breath, so that we may have life, that we may have joy, love, peace, and faith. Hear us as we pray your prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In our time of offering, we want to continue to be mindful of how we give to God because he has given so generously to us. These gifts that you give to our our local church and allow us to be a ministry to our community and to those around the world. So thank you for your generosity to God this day. Oh 
you're well and happy and I hope that you will enjoy your day. We're going to begin children's sermon by reading from God's Holy Word and God's Holy Word is the Bible and this morning the scripture is short but it's powerful and it's found in Matthew chapter 5 verse 7. Blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy and when I read that passage of scripture and I thought about a man named George who owned a grocery store. All of these things together just happened to remind me of a story. Well, George owned a little grocery store in his neighborhood, and it was called George's Minute Mart. And George sold a lot of things in his grocery store. He sold milk and bread and canned goods. He had a little deli, and he also sold newspapers. And everybody in the neighborhood shopped in George's store because the big supermarket was just too far away. And so, he, like I said, he sold several things, and he also sold newspapers. 
And one day, while he was at the cash register checking someone out, one of the ladies, or one of the young women that shopped there real often, he noticed that she reached down and picked up a newspaper and put it in her jacket. And George thought, she's stealing that. I'll overlook it today, and I'll watch her the next time that she comes in. Well, there was a lady in the store who was kind of known as the neighborhood busybody. She saw her put the newspaper in her jacket. She reached in her purse, pulled out her cell phone, and dialed 911. And immediately, the police, the fire truck, the first responders came because she told them there was a robbery going on at George's Mini Mart. Well, the police came in and said, George, are you having a robbery? And he didn't say anything, and this Miss Busy Busybody said, there she is, I saw her, she stole a newspaper. The policeman kind of rolled his eyes and said, well, George, what do you want us to do? Do you want us to take her to jail, or, or what would you have us to do? And George looked at her and he said, why did you steal that newspaper? And she said, well, I've been out of work for six months, and I didn't have food to feed my children. And I thought if I got a paper and saw the Help Wanted, wanted ads, I might be able to find a job. And the policeman says, well, George, what do you want us to do? He said, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give her a job in my store. And I want her to go back there and get enough groceries for her and the children to last until she gets her first paycheck. Well, Miss Busybody said, huh, I think everybody learned a lesson there that day because, you see, George showed her mercy. And what is mercy? Mercy means not getting punished when we deserve it. And just as George showed mercy to that woman and forgave her, so God gives us mercy for things we've done wrong, and he forgives us. Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. I don't know about you, but I'm sure glad he does. And there's two things that we can learn from this about God's mercy. We can thank him for it, and we can show mercy to other people when they do something harmful to us. So let's bow our head for a word of prayer. Dear Father, thank you so much for showing us mercy and forgiving us when we do something wrong. Help us to remember to show mercy to others when they say or do hurtful things to us. In Jesus we are continuing our journey, our in-depth look at 1 Corinthians 13, this love chapter. So often when we hear uh, these familiar scripture passage or any familiar scripture passage, our tendency is to say, yeah, 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 I know that one. That's not anything new or that's familiar to us. And when it, we become familiar with something, we get complacent around it. So I want us to continue to challenge ourselves as we are, are wrapping up this series in the next couple weeks uh, to put ourselves in this place, to put our name in where it says love, for us to be challenged to hear this word anew to us this day that, that God wants to speak to us. So 1 Corinthians 13, beginning with verse 4, says this, Love is patient and love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. Love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes, and love always perseveres. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So today we are looking at love always protects, love always trusts or believes. Love always protects, love always trusts or believes. Protection. I don't know about you, but at the end of a long day, 
at the end of maybe a long week, there's nothing like pulling in the driveway and entering your home, the thing that is familiar, that is comfortable, a place of welcome and rest, and that there's a time of protection there. It's like a covering. It, it is a shelter um, of, of, of hope and of love that most of us experience when we come home. This is exactly the image that is being used in this word protect. This image that we have is not only just a shelter that we would run to if it was raining or in the midst of a storm, but it's also a place of a cloak of love, a place that we experience this uh, feeling of being wrapped around, of being cared for, of being protected and loved. It's, we find this same uh, image even at the beginning of time, at the beginning story. We go back to the Garden of Eden, and there Adam and Eve were told not to eat of the forbidden tree, not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and yet they did, and suddenly they are very aware of their condition. They went from being naked and unashamed to being naked and ashamed. They were, their eyes were open um, to all that was around them in a way that they began to see sin and shame falling into their life. They longed for protection in these moments. They hid, it says in the scripture, behind the bushes. They hid from God. They began to sew together fig leaves so they could hide themselves in their shame. God came looking for them, walking in the cool of the day to have the, the normal conversation that he had with Adam and Eve, and yet he found them hiding. And yes, there were consequences to their sin, and that we continue to live in those consequences, but we see that even in the midst of their disobedience, even in the midst of their sinfulness, God does this. The Lord God made clothes from animal skins for the man and his wife, and he dressed them. In the midst of, of all that was happening, of how things had changed in the world that God had created, that he cared and protected Adam and Eve in the midst of that. He came along beside them and provided for them. Let's see how he did this. First of all, he killed an innocent animal. He took an animal who knew no sin, did not sin, did not deserve to die, and yet he killed them to shed their blood, to use their skin for Adam and Eve to have clothing, pro proper clothing, the appropriate clothing besides fig leaves. And then he actually made the clothing for them. He, he sewed the skin together. He knew exactly what size they would need, and he began to sew. The one who created the animal is now the one who's creating the skin from the animal. And then it says he dressed them. So Adam and Eve, having no concept of how to get dressed or how to wear the dress, just like a toddler who tries to dress themselves and ends up with pants backwards and shirt inside out, and maybe the, the head um, hole of a shirt is in the arm, and they get all tangled up. And God, patiently, like a parent, dresses Adam and Eve in the way that is appropriate. He provides for them in the same way he provides for us all these years later. He continues to minister to us and protect to us even when we eat the forbidden fruit, even when we say what we shouldn't say and do what we shouldn't do or don't do what we should do or don't say what we should say. When shame comes along, and, and tries to clothe us and su surround us. We try to sow our fig leaves of excuses and justifications of why we have done or not done what we should. We try to cover ourselves in the good deeds. We try to make up for it, and yet that all falls away, and we know that it's not, we don't measure up, and it's not enough. 
and we find ourselves naked and vulnerable once again. And then God steps in, and he sheds the innocent blood of his son, Jesus Christ. He offers his life for us. He clothes us, as it says in the scripture, with robes of righteousness to be right with him once again, to be right with one another once again. I love what Max Lucado says, we hide, but he seeks. We bring sin, and he brings the sacrifice. We, we try fig leaves, and he brings the robes of righteousness. And we are left singing the song of the prophet Isaiah when he says, He has covered me with the clothes of salvation and wrapped me in the coat of goodness, like a bridegroom dresses for his wedding and like a bride dresses in jewels. God has come to us. He has clothed us in love. He has protected us. Can you take just a moment to reflect on your life? Where has God protected you? Maybe you didn't see it in the moment, but now looking back, you see where God has covered you with a cloak of love and protected you. Maybe he protected you from a, a harmful workful work environment um, that you didn't get the job and you only learned later that how toxic that environment was. Maybe he protected you from a bad relationship. Maybe he protected you from a wreck or an accident. Are there times when God has protected you from false accusations? It says in 2 Thessalonians 3, 3, He will strengthen and protect you. In Psalm 91, He will command His angels to guard over you. God protects us with His cloak of love. And He calls for us to always do the same with one another. Because He has done it for us, we are called to do it for one another. Always, 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 we do it in response to what he has done for us. We love because he first loved us. We do it unto the least of these because he has done it unto us the least as well. We serve because he has first served us. So we cover our, our, neighborly, our neighbor who is elderly with a weekly check-in just to see how they're doing and make sure that they're all right. We cover a a sick child with chicken noodle soup and comforting words that it's all going to be okay. We cover a teenager by showing up at their games and, and, and cheering them on so that they know that they are loved. We cover the lonely with a phone call to let them know that, indeed, we're thinking of them and they are not forgotten. So why do we cover people in love? Why do we come along and and help protect them? It's because we believe in each person. That's what scripture says, that love always protects, love always believes, or trust. Always believes in people. Do you remember the prodigal son story? Another one of those familiar stories that we tend to gloss over. and We tend to know all the details and yet not fully understand what this story means. The younger son insults his father by asking for half of the inheritance. In, in essence, saying to his father, I wish you were dead so that I could have half of the money to go spend as I want. The father gives it anyway. The young son goes and squanders all of his inheritance on wild living, and he finds himself in a desperate place where he is feeding pigs, and the food that he's feeding, the slop that he has given to them, actually looks good because he's so hungry. And so he begins the journey home and the rehearsal of the script that he's going to tell his father how he does not deserve anything, but if he could just allow him to work for him, he would be glad to do it. 
And yet the father sees him from long away away. And he starts running toward his son who is dead and yet is still alive to him. And when he sees him, he tells um, the, the servants, get my robe and put around him that cloak of love to wrap around him and get my ring, he says, and put it on his finger. In Jesus' day, a ring was more than just a, a gift. It was more just a, a beautiful um, piece of jewelry to wear. It was the symbol of authority and sovereignty. Anyone who had the family ring could speak on behalf of the family, could do business on behalf of the family, could sign and do transactions on behalf of the family. And here, this youngest son who had squandered and, and basically thrown away half of the family's inheritance is being given the chance to sign and to do business on behalf of the family because the father believed in him. The father trusted in him. The father, our father, our heavenly father, believes in us in the same way. He has given us the authority to speak on his behalf here on earth. He has given us the ability to do business for him, to be his hands and feet. And guess what? We've often squandered the blessings he has given to us, the gifts and the talents that he has entrusted us with. We have promoted ourselves instead of promoting him. We have taken his gifts and used them for personal gain. We have often been mesmerized with the trappings of this world and forgotten our purpose in this life. And yet he still believes in us. He still trusts us. He still covers us with his cloak of love, his robe of love, and he gives to us the ring that signifies that he believes in us. Robert Rosenthal did a test with elementary school students and their teachers. He and the principal uh, came together and decided they would test every student. In each class, they randomly selected five or six students to tell the teacher that these are the students that scored exceptionally high and they had uh, exceptional learning abilities. And so they told the names of of these children to the student, I mean, to the teachers. And yet, in reality, these students scored average, just as average as most of the other students in the class. They, they didn't score exceptionally high. And yet, by the end of the year, when they were tested again, their, their test scores went up immeasurably because the teachers, whether they realized it or not, treated those students differently. They, they saw that their tone of voice, their interaction with the students, their facial expressions, often just a touch that communicated their expectations to these students, that they believed in them, that they saw potential in them. And at the end of the year, there was significant results because of that. The attitude of these teachers, without realizing, made these students better because they believed in them. Have you had a teacher or someone who's believed in you like that? Who has seen the potential in you and and what that did for you? In seventh grade, I had Miss Rains as a homeroom teacher. She was my language arts teacher. And up until seventh grade, I had always scored a grade level behind in reading, in my skills, and my comprehension. But in seventh grade, that changed because Mrs. Rain saw potential in me. And she began to believe in me as no teacher had ever done. She began giving me books that she thought I would be interested in. That year, I read Corey Ten Boone's The Hiding Place. And a whole new world opened up for me. Reading wasn't just a chore that I had to do, that I had to endure, but it became a place that I could escape and learn and to uh, find freedom in reading what was out there. 
that year, not only did I begin to read on grade level, but I even went above. It was all because Miss Rains believed in me. The difference that love can make when we believe in one another. When we see the potential of God working in each person. When we come along people, alongside people, and we, we surround them with the cloak of love, and we give them the ring that says, I believe in you. Just as God has done it for us, so we do it for one another. So who, who is God calling you this day to show that cloak of love Who is God calling you today to put on the ring of belief, to say, I believe in you, so that that life is transformed, continues to be transformed in the love of Jesus Christ? Let us pray. Lord, we are grateful that you believed in us, that you continue to pour out your love upon us, that you clothe us in your righteousness for all that you have done for us. Lord, give us the courage and the strength to do for others. Place in our path this day people that we can say to them, you are loved and we believe in you, that you would allow us the opportunity to speak words of encouragement, to come alongside, to believe in those that no one else sees potential so that lives can be transformed for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. During our prayer time, we... uh, prayed the song, the hymn, Breathe on Me, Breath of God, and we'll conclude this worship service by singing that very hymn. Will you join with us? Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit so fill us so that we share the love through our cloaks and through the rings of believing in others. Amen.